Hello YouTube, if this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Rosie and I am a Kiwi living in France, which is why today I wanted to do a video on the biggest culture shocks New Zealand to France that I've encountered. The kind of things that make you go, say what? And there's so many of them, I've narrowed it down to just 20, but I will break it down into two parts, so we'll do part one today and part two next time. So let's get started. So one of the first things that I noticed about my French peers, and my European peers as well, but my French peers in particular, is that they're just so well educated. They have such a broad general knowledge about history, art, science, geography, politics, economics. And of course we get taught these things in New Zealand, but I'm sure we didn't go that into depth. You'll just be having a general conversation with people and they'll be like, oh, well, we all know what happened in 1712, ho, ho, ho. And I'll be there like, yeah, we sure do. So I was doing a little bit of research trying to figure out why I graduated feeling so thick. And actually I found that if you compare the educational performance between New Zealand and France, we actually outperform France in maths and science and reading. And when I digged a little bit deeper, I figured out that actually New Zealand has what we call a skills-based education system where we really focus on very practical, applicable topics like science and maths. And France has a content-based education system, which means that they'll spend more time building very broad general bases of knowledge. And typical New Zealander will be like, well, what are you gonna do with yourself after that? You know, so it's really, we're always thinking, what can we study that will be applicable and will get us a job? And the result is that I feel slightly less cultured compared to my French friends, and that's probably an understatement. The second cultural difference that I noticed pretty much straight away was around food. And I think I'm going to do a whole separate video on this topic because the French have a very complex relationship with their food. But what I will say is that there are so many unwritten rules and rituals when it comes to food in France. For example, you have just three meals per day. You have your breakfast, your lunch and your dinner. And you don't snack. But if you do snack, it's an official thing called a goûter and you take that at 4 p.m. And also you're eating real meals in these moments. So you sit down for lunch and you will have a chicken breast and vegetables and potatoes. Like I'm talking quite big hot meals. And after each meal, even the lunch, you always finish with something sweet. So either a yogurt or a fruit or some form of dessert, I've noticed. And I never used to need dessert after lunch. And now I need dessert after lunch. And they're just so civilized. They use then cutlery for everything, which makes me sound really rough. But I mean nachos, burgers, pizzas. French people eat those with a knife and a fork. One area though where I do think we have one up on the French is with the bread. So with the baguette, they'll cut it up and they'll just put their piece of bread on the table beside them. So they won't actually put it on a bread plate. I mean, what if it's dirty? What if a fly had just landed on that spot? So to be honest, I feel having a bread plate or at least putting your piece of bread on your plate is one step up from the French. Another culture shock is related to very common household items. So in Europe, they have these really large square pillows that you sleep on rather than the standard rectangle that I'm used to. And I just think that these are kind of ridiculous. Like I've literally bought one here. This pillow is so huge, it's so square, and all of the space just gets wasted because you've, you've got your head like this. So I'm going to sleep, here I am going to sleep on my big square pillow. And I must have like 40, 50 centimeters above me. Another common household item that kind of made me be like, what is the common shower? So their shower heads are often detached. You know, when you've got the detached shower heads off the wall with the kind of paddled head, which is all very well and fine. But in most circumstances, they don't have the attachment that actually holds the head up so you've just got the pedal and you're trying to like wash yourself and hold your shower pedal in the other hand and so now I've noticed like 
in more modern apartments and more modern showers, they do have the attachment that allows you to sort of place the head in place, which is fine. But I just kind of find it weird that every single shower in France is detached. Oh, and speaking of showers, I've always noticed as well that when French people stay with me, I mean, not that I'm listening to people showering, don't get the wrong impression, but I have actually noticed that people will turn on the shower and then stop the shower and I'll be like, oh, okay, they're finished. But then I hear the shower come on again. This must be because they can't hold the shower head in their hands. Number four is, of course, lubbies, the famous kisses that you give each other when you greet each other in France. So firstly, it's super confusing about how many bees are meant to be giving to each person. It depends on the region and even the French don't really know. Like they've actually started a website called combiendebees.com so that people can figure out what the rules are socially. So sometimes it's very awkward, like you're going in for another one, so the person's already stopped, you feel like you're coming on too strong. It can be very confusing. And I just kind of found it funny how you greet absolute strangers in the same way that you greet your own mother. For us, I guess the next level would be hugging someone, so giving them a big bear hug. But if you hug people here, they kind of freeze like, oh, what are you doing to me? Um, so yeah, stick to the bees, but it's, um, it, it's hard to get used to sometimes where you're just like kissing people like, hey, you who I don't know. Number five is the French and their pharmacies. My gosh, I have never seen so many pharmacies in my life on my street alone. I've got three pharmacies and I'm not exaggerating. And on my first trip to the doctors, I soon found out why. I had such a simple common cold and he must have given me like eight medications. He's just throwing pills out like it's a lolly scramble. Pills for everybody. According to the OECD, France are Europe's number one pill poppers when it comes to prescribed medication. Why? Maybe it's because healthcare over here is basically free. And if not, you take a private health insurance called a Mutuel, which kind of tops it up to make sure that is free when you go to the doctor or you go to the pharmacy and get your medication. And so I think we've got some very enthusiastic doctors over here and some very wealthy pharmacists. Number six is maybe a little bit harder to explain if you've never lived in New Zealand, but I just feel like we've got a totally different approach to time over here. Firstly, we've got a lot less of it, in Paris at least. So in New Zealand, a typical work day would be, you'd be at work from 8.30 till 5.30, you'd have a quick 30 minute lunch break, quickly eat a sandwich, snack all afternoon, and you'd be out the door and you'd be able to go to the gym, so you'd do some sport and you'd have dinner, and then I'd feel like you'd still have your whole evening ahead of you. Whereas here, it's like things are kind of just slower somehow. You've got the commute, you usually start work quite late, like around 9.30. Um, I often don't finish work until 7.30, 8, you commute all the way back home. I mean, here, if you're eating at 8 to 9 p.m., it's super normal. And at first when I arrived, I was starving by that time. And by the time you sort of eat and you take your shower and, I mean, it's 11 p.m. Here during the weeks, at, in Paris at least, this is what they say, it's metro boulot dodo. And that is so true. You take the metro, you work and you go to bed. And that's sort of all you do during the weeks, unless you're a super energizer bunny. And the nice side of things is that life does adapt. So the post office is open till 8 p.m. And at 11 p.m., the streets are still lively and brimming with energy. You've got people out for dinner, drinking. Whereas in New Zealand, sometimes at 5 p.m., everything's closing down and it sort of becomes a shanty town. So yeah, there's pros and cons too. Number seven, and it may be related to what I was just saying about the lack of time, is that there seems to be way less of a sports and gym culture here. So in New Zealand, I mean, a lot of people would turn up to the office in the morning with their gym bag. They'd obviously been up at 6 a.m. doing sports or they have their gym bag and they're going to sports after work. And it was like a, a daily thing almost. Like people on average, I'd say, would aim to get to the gym three to five times a week or do some kind of sport. And sport was sport. I mean, I'm talking you're in the gym, you're lifting weights, you're doing one hour intensive courses. I mean, you sweat. Over here, I've got way less French 
gym buddies than I do international gym buddies. Um, I don't know why, but there doesn't seem to be so much of a gym culture over here. And for them, even if they just walk up some stairs or go shopping or something, they say that they did some sport. For me, that's just living. But yeah, it, it counts as sports here. And it's true that in Paris, by the time you're walking around, taking a metro, getting to work and stuff, you probably easily walk five kilometers a day just by living. So you do walk a lot, but it's not exactly what I would call sport. Okay, so the eighth cultural shock that I also noticed is that there seems to be a real problem with waiting here. So for example, if you go to the bank or if you're going to buy a ticket down in the metro, it can be normal that you'll have like five people in front of you, right? I mean, that's just part of life. But here, I kind of feel like that's a big issue. So if you're in the bank and you notice that there's a queue, if a French person comes up behind you and has like maybe six people in front of them, you'll definitely hear like a, oh la la, oh, like, when you need to wait or when you need to queue, it seems to be a very frustrating and annoying situation. And I mean, no one loves queuing. Like it's not my favorite pastime to queue, but you know, it's part of life or in a big city. Sometimes you have to wait for five to 10 minutes to get what you want. But here, I mean, you'll, you'll hear about it. And another place where you see the problem with waiting is at pedestrian crossings. The cars don't really wait for pedestrians. You'll be there at the pedestrian crossing and they'll just be zooming on past you. And even when the little man is green, I mean, you better watch yourself. Like I look both ways and make sure that nothing's coming or if something's coming, I make sure that he's seen me because otherwise he'll be there. And even, even if he is there waiting for me, he's there like revving to go, especially the guys on the motorbikes. And as soon as you've gone past them, just one centimeter, you'll hear this vroom, and they'll just zoom past you. They, they sound like they've been so angry having to wait just five seconds while you crossed in front of them. Number nine is quite a New Zealand specific one, I think. But what I have noticed in France and what I like about France is that it's actually okay to accept compliments here. And if someone compliments you and say something nice about you, you can smile and take it and that's it. In New Zealand, we suffer from tall poppy syndrome, which means that we like everyone to kind of be the same and we like to stay down and low key and the same as everyone. If you can imagine a field of poppies and there's one poppy that stands out taller than the others, the others will cut it down. It's really highly valued to be as humble as possible and as self-deprecating as possible. I think over here where people would be like, oh, nice dress, Rosie, I'd be like, oh, this old thing, oh, it's nothing, it was so cheap, I got it on sale. Honestly, I think it brings out my fat ass. I mean, I think the French people were quite shocked. They were like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, don't be so mean to yourself. So I'm very happy with this cultural gift that France has given me where now if someone compliments me, I'll just say merci. Cultural shock number 10 really revolves around how socializing is done here. And this is probably just because I'm in Paris, I will say that, but I kind of feel like to see your friends, it's like scheduling an appointment with a doctor or a lawyer. You need to figure out your availabilities like two, three weeks in advance, book in some time with them. At home, you can just go around to people's houses. You can just text them last minute, like, hey, coming around to your house, or not even text them, just show up. Whereas here, it's like, everyone's so busy and they're all booked out in advance. I often get canceled on as well, but even my close friends, like, you'll always have to double check that they're still coming. Like, oh, we're still on for tonight because the risk of canceling, I feel, is like 50-50. I found that kind of funny as well when I was adjusting to the way socializing gets done here. Cool, so that's all from me for now, party people, because I will be coming back at you with part two of these cultural shocks for the next 10 cultural shocks that I noticed. And if you like any topics to do with France, expat life, living abroad, New Zealand, travel, this kind of thing, could be a good idea to subscribe so that we can get to know each other a little bit more as time goes on. So I look forward to seeing you then, and until then, a bientôt.